Hi, <clears throat> how's it going? So WGSL, Web GPU Shading Language, can be a little intimidating when you first see it. So I wanted to go through a bunch of um, shader code that I wrote with just a lot more detail. Oh, definition as an I. Um, so the first thing I should say is this specification here is really, really good. This is where I'm getting a lot of this, a lot of these explanations. Anytime I want to implement something, I just read the specification and um, most of the time it goes straight forward. Specification has examples and all sorts of things. You can search it. It's really, really good. So that should be your primary source in learning about this stuff. But um, let me talk through, let me talk through this program. So first up, what I'm doing here is I'm defining a bunch of structs because I've got my program on one side running on TypeScript and it has a whole bunch of data that it's throwing at the shader module that it's throwing at the GPU. Um, but then on the other side, on the shader side, the shader doesn't have a link to that same semantic meaning. So all it's seeing is a bunch of bytes and it's saying, okay, well, you just threw what 64 bytes at me here. What am I meant to do with it? And then it's this struct definition that says, well, if you get 64 bytes and you've been told that it's one of these things, then the first 32 bytes are, you know, each of those bytes is a float and it's a four by four matrix. So this is sort of repacking on the shader side. It's the importance of having these structs. And over here, we've got an array of four by four matrices, but we don't have a size. So what we could do is we, we could, if we wanted to give this a constant size, just go an array of this type, size six, but we also have the option of not specifying a size. And that's okay if the array, which doesn't have a size specified is the last field of the struct. Because, well, if, if I were to go, okay, now I've got, um, uh, something else, uh, maybe not that, um, something which is a float. Well then the, the program will need to know what's the location of the float. And it doesn't know the location of the float because we don't know how much space this, this arbitrary sized array is going to take. So if we have this sort of situation, what we want to do is always specify all of the sized things up front and then the arbitrary sized thing, typically only one, um, have that at the end. So yeah, what this is saying is when we get given a whole bunch of bytes, pack them into an array, work out the size at the time when it happens. Um, so then we have this, uh, these bindings here. So up here we have binding group zero. So group zero, binding zero. It's this uh, transform data, that's a uniform. And then here we have group zero binding one is this storage buffer. It's set in read only mode. And we start to see that there's a bunch of different little keywords coming in here. So these keywords are specifying two things. They're specifying the address space and the access mode. Okay. So for the address space, there's a whole bunch of these. We can have a function level variable. A function level variable, by the way, is just a regular variable. So if I were to go over to my ray tracer kernel and then down to some code, where are we? Yeah, here we have a whole bunch of variables. These are function level variables. So we could write something like that, specify it's in the function address space. But as it turns out, you don't need to specify the address space for function variables. Because I guess they figured if you're writing var function everywhere, that's, that's not good. Um, other options are private. Now a private variable 
does need to be declared at the module level, so outside of the functions. That's fine. Um, yeah, work group. So a work group variable is when you're doing a compute shader, it gets split up. Yeah, it gets split up into work groups. And then the variable will be accessible to everything across the work groups. But I actually don't use these. If I'm using a compute shader, I use uniforms because they are visible to every single invocation of the compute shader. I don't need to worry about work groups and things. I probably will do a video in future digging more into work groups and what they are and how things split up. But anyway, um, then we have storage buffers or another type of address space and then handle and the spec states that handle is used for sample and texture variables. So down below, down below, I've got this variable, my texture. I could have specified that it has a handle address space. But again, just like with function variables, they do not need to be specified explicitly. It, it can be read from the context. Um, then we have store type. Now a store type is basically the type of the variable. So for this variable, the name is transform UBO and its store type is this transform data struct, which was specified up above. So this can be a, like a primitive data type, like a float 32 or a VEC3 or something, or it can be a defined type. So down below this uh, objects, its store type is that object data that I declared up above. Uh, my texture again is a handle address space and its storage type, its store type is a texture 2D. We'll dig into that in a second. Now, in addition to this, in addition to the address space, we can also specify the uh, access mode. Now the access mode has a default value. We only need to, well, we only can set it for storage buffers and, oh, mm, you've got storage textures as well, but um, it's what you would expect. It's read, write, or both. Okay, now moving on. Oh yeah, so, so up above or down below, here we have a storage buffer and its access mode is read. It's read only. Okay, so down below we have my texture. Now, there are a whole bunch of different texture types we can specify. They are here. We have one dimensional, two dimensional, and so on. In a future video, what I'll do is I'll make a 2D array and I'll pack in all the different textures as different layers. So I only need to bind it once. But um, also we have the, the pixel type and there are only three types we can have. We can have uh, float 32, integer 32 or unsigned integer 32. That's it. So hopefully as you start to see some of these options and go in and read the documentation, you'll start to get more familiar with what's available to you. You start to see how you can mix and match things. Okay, so down below we have this vertex shader and then this fragment shader. And these are defined as functions within the same file and they're specified with these little decorators that go on top. Now we can more or less imagine that we have a vertex shader and it does its thing and throws its output and its output ends up in the fragment shader. Now it does go through other stages, but or at least one more stage, the rasterizer, but we can think about it this way. So a really good convention is to set up a, set up a struct which explicitly has all of the data that you want to send to the fragment shader, because then you can semantically fill that in. You can semantically write to it. You can semantically read from it. You don't have to worry about, anyway, it bundles a lot of things together. It's really good. So that's what I'm doing here. I've got this fragment struct and it is the output of my vertex shader. And it is sort of, implicitly taken as the input to the 
fragment shader, if that makes sense. So if we look here, we're just passing through texture coordinate at the moment. Now the texture coordinate is written to here and because we've decorated it and said, okay, this is location zero, that is read directly here. It's the same texture coordinate that we wrote to over here in the fragment shader, a uh, vertex shader, I mean. So just to dial back a bit, see we have this built-in keyword. Now this is a built-in variable. There's actually a, a whole bunch of these. Um, if we look in here, we have some examples. We can have the vertex index, which is taken as input to the vertex shader, the instance index, and so on and so on. Here I'm using the position. Now it's stated that this has to be an output in some way has to be returned by the vertex shader. So when we output something from the vertex shader, the program will look in there and say, hey, have you outputted the built-in position variable? And it will look for that specifically as like a keyword. And it can also be taken as input to the fragment shader. So in the fragment shader, we can query the uh, position. Then we have a whole bunch of these other things, I guess. The only other really important one that I use is global invocation ID. So when you dispatch a compute shader, you have like a grid of little jobs that it works on, basically each pixel of the screen, and the global invocation ID will tell you where your invocation is in the, in the global picture, in other words, over the whole screen. So there are some alignment issues. If I go up here, these structs are all based around mat fours. And if I didn't have mat fours, I'd have vec fours, you know, like four is a magic number. If we stick with four, our life will be easy. If we don't stick with four due to alignment issues, it's more performant for the program to have a whole bunch of empty floats, a whole bunch of padding that it doesn't use, that's better than fragmenting its addresses when it, when it looks up things. So if we go over to the ray tracer kernel example that I've got here and we go up to the, yeah, okay. So we go up to the sphere here. Now this color and radius together would make four floats. So that is fine. However, the program will implicitly add one float worth of padding so that everything is aligned. And we have to correct for that. So again, if we were go to go down to this ray, no, the ray is fine. Yep, the ray is fine. But then if we were go to go down to this uh, scene data, we would have similar issues. We'd have to worry about padding and things. So the long story short is if you can bundle things together into groups of four, the same way I've done here, the same way I've done here, then everything will go nicely. Here we would probably, yeah, just off the top of my head, we would actually have a whole bunch of padding to get these things into groups of four. So we would have to account for that when we're throwing the data over, but that's, I think I've covered that in a past video. I'm, I'm rambling. I was just going to say that I'm also using another built-in variable here to get the instance index. And that is used to access into the storage buffer. Anyway, this has just been sort of a brief overview of WGSL and some of the options that we have available. And again, it really comes back to read the documentation. Um, WGSL spec, Google it, um, look it up. It's a really good documentation, really good examples and really well explained. But anyway, this has just been my little brief overview. So yeah, have a good one and I'll see you next time. Bye.